the eighth message in a series in 1 John, and our message is in chapter 2, and I'm going to read at verse 3 through verse 11. My message is verses 7 through 11, but I'm going to read verse 3 through 11. <clears throat> and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that keeps on saying, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, that is, as the habitual practice of his life, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. <clears throat> Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that keeps on saying, here's this hypothetical man again, that he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. 1 John 5.13 is the key verse of this little epistle of John. In the closing chapter, in that 13th verse, he gives his reasons for writing this pastoral letter, as it's often called, to the children of God. These things I write unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. I was thinking today how much God's people need to be assured and reassured that eternal life is really manifest in them. I need to be assured and reassured because of the unreality of the world we live in. Everything in this world system, everything in our wicked hearts, everything that is under the control and power of Satan is set against the believer to weaken his faith, to discourage him in the inner man, shake the foundations of that which he believes, to convince him that there isn't anything to believe, and if there is something to believe, he himself hasn't really believed. And so we are the constant target of every enemy of God. And the inner man is often assaulted in this matter of assurance. Yet on the other hand, the Holy Spirit delights in assuring his people. I never spend a few moments in reflection and meditation on my own heart ever along this line without being assured and reassured of the Holy Spirit, that the evidences of that eternal life were present. These things were written that you might know. God wants you to know from moment to moment and to be assured from moment to moment. And really what I see in all of these evidences and proofs of 1 John is the Holy Spirit's desire to have you recognize how much the work of grace has really done in each of us. The Holy Spirit works day after day in the lives of his people. So much that he does is unrecognized by us. So much that he does we do not comprehend. And yet he that hath begun this good work in us continues to perform it. And he will even down until the day of Jesus Christ. And John brings into focus perhaps the many things that we take for granted and glorifies them and magnifies them and exalts them and sets them before us and makes us to see that these things are the work of grace in our hearts. For instance, in our message this past Sunday, John brings to our attention the fact that every believer has this inward tender conscience toward the word and will of God. No matter whether he fails in doing the will of God or no matter how many times he is disobedient, yet down in his heart there is, I repeat, this tender conscience toward the will and word of God. He simply wants to do what Jesus wants him to do because he loves Jesus, no other reason. 
This is present in the heart of every believer. It's one of the evidences of the Holy Spirit's ministry. It is to give us a caution upon our hearts. Uh, take away our confidence in the flesh. Give to us a holy fear of displeasing him. Give to us daily a desire to be what he wants us to be, do what he wants us to do. This is present in the believer, and he puts it into this kind of wording. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Then he goes on to say that those who keep his commandments it is because they abide in him, and it is because the love of God is perfected in them. And now at verses 7 through 11, he enlarges on this proposition of the believer's tender conscience toward the word and will of God, and he names one of the precepts as an example. Though he were saying, now I will give you an example of what I'm talking about. I'm going to remind you of a commandment. And your attitude or your performance toward this commandment is a real test of whether you're really in the light or not. You may think that it is a new commandment, but it is not. It's an old commandment. It's a commandment you've known from the very beginning. Yet it's new in a sense, in that it became new to you when you came to know Jesus, and it's, pardon such language, becoming newer and newer every day, for the darkness is passing away and the light is shining more and more in your heart. So now John is going to set a new commandment before us, yet another new commandment. And if it is true that you abide in him, if it is true that you are in the light, if it is true that Jesus is your propitiation and your advocate at the right hand of God, if it is true that you have fellowship with him, if it is true that in your heart there is that tender persuasion that longs to do the will of God, if it is true that the love of God is made perfect in you, this commandment reveals it to others. Let me tell you what the commandment is. He addresses us as brethren. Here is a new term now introduced in 1 John. If I were to give it a literal translation, it would be these two words, beloved ones. And the original language brings out how John has in mind the divine love of God bestowed upon his people. So he first of all reminds us before he introduces the commandment that we who are truly saved are the objects of divine love. Dearly beloved ones, divinely loved ones, John begins this presentation of the commandment. He tells us the commandment is not new. Let me put in the plain words what it is. It is simply this, that we should love the brethren. And any man who says that he is in the light or that he abides in Jesus, and he hates his brother, is in darkness even until now. And if any man love his brethren, as this commandment tells us, it is because he abides in the light and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. So I want to tell you what the commandment was before we talk about the new and the old part of it. This is a new commandment, and yet it's an old one. And this is one of the very, very perplexing passages of First John. The more I studied into this passage and meditated on it, the more confused I became. John seems to be saying two different things. He says it's an old commandment, and then he says it's a new one. But the words of the original language bring out this thought. It's an old commandment as far as time is concerned, for it has been since the beginning of your Christian experience, and it has existed since the beginning of Jesus' life and ministry upon earth. Yet it is a new commandment because it became new to us when we came in to the right relationship with Jesus. It is a new commandment in the sense that day by day, more and more of it is being revealed in us and through us. The darkness is passing away and the light is continuing to shine in us. And so John emphasizes, first of all, the fact that it is no new commandment. 
It has existed from the beginning of our Christian experience. Again, the original text brings out how that from the very first day we were saved, this commandment was constantly set before us, constantly impressed upon us, constantly worked within us, constantly made new and real to us. And this leads me to some conclusions, practical conclusions. One, every Christian, at the moment he becomes a Christian, unconsciously obeys this commandment. Yet he doesn't know a thing about it. Isn't that wonderful? Unconsciously, when a man is saved, he begins to obey this commandment. What is this commandment? That he love the brethren? That he love his brother? He obeys this commandment, and day by day this old commandment is made new and real in him, and he sees that this commandment had its origin in Jesus himself and now is being worked in him. So it's no new commandment. This commandment was worked in Jesus. He loved us. He loved us from the very day he came into this world. Having loved his own, he loved them even unto the end. He set before his people while upon the earth, and now in his word before us, the constant, consistent, never changing love of God. Jesus loved us in spite of what we were, loved us in spite of what we are, loved us in spite of all that we will yet do and be in this present life. Having loved us before the foundation of the world, he loves us now and loves us forever. And I think it is really Jesus that is the subject of that verse in the Old Testament that says, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. We have seen the perfect obedience of the Lord Jesus to the commandment, God is love, love one another. Jesus came into this world to manifest the love of God to us. And so John says the beginning of this commandment was in him and now it has worked in you, so it is no new commandment. You have known it from the very beginning, yet you couldn't analyze it or find it in the Bible or intelligently discuss it with others. Here was a commandment of God that was written upon your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the power of that same Holy Spirit, you have obeyed it. And this proves, John says, that you really do abide in Him, that there is none occasion of stumbling in you, not either for yourself or toward others. Yet in a sense, this commandment is new in that it is daily being made new to us. There is this verse that says, Again a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. One translator says, The darkness is passing by us believers like a parade. And in its place, more and more light is given. This is the Holy Spirit's description of the Christian life. Darkness passing before us like a parade. Now, you know, a parade has a beginning and it has an end. And the Holy Spirit pictures the believer as kind of a spectator in his life. Every day he abides in Christ. Every day he has fellowship with God who is light. Every day, in communion with the Holy Spirit, more and more darkness passes away from his life, and more and more light comes in. So this commandment is made new from day to day in him. He sees the renewing of the love of God in his heart from day to day toward the brethren. So this is some of the complications of these words that John sets before us. He first establishes in the first part of the chapter that if we're really saved, if we do abide in Christ, if we are in the light, if we do have a real living fellowship with God the Father, then we have the right kind of a heart towards His commandments. There is an obedience 
a tender persuasion in our soul that longs to keep his commandments and do them. And as an example, here is the greatest commandment of all, which was from the beginning, so it is not a new commandment, yet it is new to us. It is this, that we love our brother. And no true believer can hate his brother, for if a man hate his brother, it is because he is walking in darkness. It's because he's blind and he doesn't know where he's going. It's because he was never saved. He is not saved now. And there is sometimes in this passage even the hint that he may not be saved because the darkness he has chosen to walk in has brought blindness to his eyes. So let me ask you the question. Do you love the brethren? Do you try to love the brethren? Do you love them because you try? Or do you love them? Is there the love of God in your heart for those who are your brothers and your sisters in Jesus? Is there something down in the inner man that draws you to those who are in Christ? Is there something down in the soul that you can't deny? Not asking if you agree with the brethren. It's not in the field of opinion. Not even in the field of whether or not you like the brethren. We may have personality differences. We may have opinion differences. There may be many, many superficial differences between the brethren. But if we are brethren, and if the Holy Spirit really lives in us, there is something in our souls for one another that we can't deny, that we can't stop, and we can't start. It's either there or it isn't there. And if it's there, it's because the Holy Spirit put it there, and we can't help ourselves. And one of the strange experiences in loving the brethren is that we love them in spite of themselves, and we love them in spite of ourselves. There are times when everything in our minds tells us we have no reason to love them, but we love them anyway. There are times when we really try not to love them, and we can't help ourselves. There is something there in our hearts toward them, and here we learn that it is the love of God made perfect in us. Remember last Sunday how I told you that in the believer, God has found a lover? He has found a heart through which he may reflect his love for others. So if we love the brethren, it is not to our credit. It is not because we have accomplished this. It is because God dwells in us, and we dwell in him. And because he dwells in us, he loves his children through us. It is not we who really love them, but it is he who loves them. And we are the channel through which he loves them. If you've ever experienced that, it should be a great joy for you. Let's look at the negative side for a moment, because John always brings up the negative and the positive. It is here in verse 9. He that keeps on saying, he is in the light, and habitually, continually, hates his brother, is in darkness even until now. The first thing I want you to notice is that John says, even until now, or up until this very moment, he is in darkness. It does not mean he was once in the light and has fallen from grace. It does not mean that he was once enlightened and now has slipped back into the darkness. John says he was never in the light, he is in darkness up until now. He was in darkness. He is in darkness. He continues in darkness to this present moment. No matter how much he keeps on saying that he's in the light. And no matter how much he keeps on saying that he can see. And no matter how much he keeps on saying that darkness is passing out of his life and light is coming. John says the acid test is this. His heart toward his brothers. I can't understand a Christian, a professing Christian, who hates the brethren. John couldn't understand it. The Holy Spirit can't understand it. He says it's an impossibility. 
If a man hate his brother, it is because he is an unsaved man. Not because he is an unspiritual man, because he is an unsaved man. Well, then why does John say if he hate his brother? Well, there's a very good reason why. First of all, a man who professes to be a Christian must be ready to answer to the responsibilities of that relationship. You go around saying that you're a believer. You go around saying that you're in the family of God. You go around professing in this world that God is your father and all those who are born of God are your brothers and sisters. There's a responsibility upon you to manifest something for that family. So John, if you let me use my expression, beats this hypothetical man with his own stick. He says, I am a believer. I abide in the light. John says, all right, love your brother. And if you hate that brother, then it is because you're in darkness even up until this present moment. And you don't need to have any theological training to test yourself to see whether you be in the faith. Here is an acid test. What is your heart towards the brethren? I don't... I'm not asking you whether you like the brethren. I'm asking you whether you love them. This is what John says. Now, he first deals with a negative case, a man who hates his brother. Now, I'd like to talk to you about hatred for a moment because it brings out an interesting thought, and that is that a man's heart is never empty. It, it, we're never in neutral towards someone. Jesus voiced this principle when he said, he that's not for me is what? Against me. There was no way for him to just be in neutral. Jesus interpreted his unwillingness to be for him as his opposition to him. I have seen this work most effect effectively in people's lives. I have seen that we can hurt others very much by simply not helping them. We may not do a thing positive to oppose them, but the fact that we do not help them is opposition to them. Jesus expressed this. If you're not for me, you're against me. If you do not love the brethren, you hate them. Now you see what this does in putting this kind of a meaning on the verse. It takes away from us the hiding place that many professing Christians like to use. They say, oh, well, I don't feel anything real positive toward the believers, but I sure don't hate them. They're nice people. I think kindly toward them. But John sees the heart as no empty vacuum. If it is not filled with the love of God for the brethren, then whatever it is that you say is in there is interpreted by the Holy Spirit as hatred for the brethren. Now, the word in the original language has two shades of meaning, and it brings out what hatred for the brethren really is. First of all, hatred is to be void of natural affection. Void of natural affection. Hatred for the brethren is just not having anything in our hearts toward them. Isn't that simple? Void of natural affection. We just don't feel anything for them. We can take them or we can leave them alone. We can be with them or not be with them as we care to. We can enjoy the presence of the unsaved just as well as we can enjoy the presence of the saved. We can have just as close of friends in the world as we can have in the assembly. We can enjoy our association and our affiliation with others just as much as we enjoy the association and the affiliation of believers. This is to be void of natural affection. What would you think if I manifest such an attitude towards my wife and children? I'd just soon be with any woman as be with Lena. I have just as good a time with your children as I have with mine. They hold no special place in my heart. I can take them or leave them alone. I enjoy my association with other families just as much as I enjoy my association with that family. What would you say of me? Well, John would say he hates his family because he does not love them. 
I hope this is becoming clear to you, is it? Somebody say okay so I know. All right. Hatred, then, is the absence of natural affection. If a believer, this is just a hypothetical case, if a believer could hate the brethren, he would have to stifle all natural affection. You get me? He would have to work at it. He would have to absolutely deny and put down and run roughshod over the natural affection that wells up in his heart toward the brethren. That's why he can't do it. It's natural to him to love the brethren. He can't help himself. You know, when a child comes into this world, it's natural for him to love his brothers, his sisters, his mother, and his father. That little baby, the first thing that little baby recognizes is a natural inclination to love that mother and to love that father. All fathers are convinced that the first words babies say is daddy. There is that natural affection for mother and for father. And then that same natural affection flows for brother and for sister. These brothers and sisters, and the word in the original, of the same womb, these who are of the same womb are in a very special relationship to the members of that family. <coughs> or they may have a good friend that lives across the street. They may have neighbors, which are very close, but they're not in the same class with those of the same womb. There is something special in their hearts toward them. And if it wasn't there, we would say they were without natural affection. And the Holy Spirit says that without natural affection, it is hatred. This kind of makes me tremble because I've actually heard people who supposed that they were Christians almost define or describe their own hearts this way. Oh, well, I, well, I feel the same toward everybody. Ah, uh, John says, if the love of the brethren is not there, whatever it is that's there is hatred because there is an absence of natural affection. All Christians should automatically by the power of the Holy Spirit, be drawn to other Christians. They should have something in their hearts for other believers that they can't stifle, they can't stop, they can't help. It's there, and they recognize it, and it springs up. It is the love of God being worked in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. And John ends this book on this subject in the fifth chapter. And he just simply says that if he's born of God and others are born of God, he can't help but love those who are born of God because they're in the same family. Well, why should I love you? And why do I love you and others who are in the body of Christ? Well, we have the same Father. We have a fellowship in Him. We have a common life in Him. Why, I can get together with my family. Supposing I would call the members of my family up here, and why, we could sit and talk about things you wouldn't know anything about. Things that we've shared together. Nobody outside the family's experienced these things. These are little private, intimate, personal things that belong to us. Well, that doesn't mean I don't like you people, but they're just, they're just in an inner circle of fellowship. They're very close to me. They're my own blood and flesh. I'm their common father. And we have shared a life together that you don't have. You're not a part of that. All right? We're in the family of God. We have a common father. We have personal experiences we can talk about the world doesn't know anything about. We can get together and talk about a circle of fellowship the world can't even comprehend. We can get together and share together little intimate, precious things that happened as a family together that have come from the same wonderful Father that all of us know. Why, there's a closeness and a nearness. There's a love that flows from our fellowship in this one Father that no one else can enter into sitting in this building will not make you a part of that fellowship. 
Coming to the assembly twice a week will make you a part of that fellowship. The only thing that can make you a part of that fellowship is to be in that family. And as hard as the believer may try because he thinks he's under a moral obligation, he cannot feel for the unsaved that special, intimate love, and he cannot enjoy that special, intimate fellowship that he knows and experiences with those who are in the family of God. Are you agreed to that? Doesn't even make any difference if those unsaved people are members of our own household. We may like them with all that we have within us to like with. We may have affection for them with all that we have within us to have affection for them. And we may say that we love them with all that we have to love them with. But there is a special love that we enjoy with the people of God that cannot include those who are outside the family of God, simply because we can't control it. And if we did control it, we'd go around bestowing it upon those who were not in the family of God and make them to believe that they were. So the Holy Spirit controls this. And he enables us to love the brethren and keep that commandment because he abides in us that we might abide in him. So, hatred is the absence of natural affection. Hatred is the absence of love based on a just estimate. Now, let me explain that. Here's what John means when he says, if a man hate his brother, one, John says this man has no natural affection for the family of God. Two, he doesn't even feel anything based on a just estimate. Now, you know, there is a type of love. We experience it among us in the world. A love that's based on a just estimate of one another. I can say, using his word loosely, well, I love this man because it is my estimate that he's a good man. And he's been good to me. He's a good neighbor, or he's a good friend, so I have an affection for him. That's an affection based upon a just estimate of that man. In other words, I have examined him and decided that he's worthy of my love and my affection, and I've bestowed it upon him. Now, John says a man who hates his brother, first, has no natural affection for him. Secondly, he doesn't even have anything in his heart for him based upon a just estimate, because he can't make a just estimate of him. The believer is just nothing to it. We have a love for one another that's based on a just estimate. What is the estimate? Well, we love one another because we're in Christ. We don't love each other for what we are or as individuals. It would be impossible. We love Jesus. And wherever we see Jesus dwells, we love the one he dwells in. The believers are precious to us because he's in them. And he's precious. We're not oblivious to the sins of other believers, the faults of other believers, the failures of other believers, the idiosyncrasies of other believers. We see them all. But somehow they don't register. They shouldn't. They don't register because love covers a multitude of sins. And when we see that believer taken in a snare, falling into sin, we take heed, restoring him in a spirit of meekness, lest we should also be tempted. We look upon him and we are reminded of our own wicked and deceitful hearts. We look upon him with compassion and remember that he, like ourselves, is only a sinner saved by grace. And we remember that God loved him and Jesus died for him. And we are reminded of the Holy Spirit that in spite of the man's sins, in spite of his failures, in spite of his faults, in spite of what we see in him that we do not like, we cannot deny this. Jesus is in him. He loves Jesus, and Jesus loves him. It makes it very simple. When Peter stood before the Lord in John 21, you remember that Jesus said three times to him, Peter, lovest thou me? 
feed my sheep. So he was trying to establish in Peter's heart the right relationship between himself and the sheep, between himself and his other brothers in the Lord. He must ever love them because he loves Jesus. And what he loves in them is Jesus. Remember how Paul exhorted the people in the Philippian church and he told them to think and to meditate and to keep in their mind's eye those things in other believers that were lovely, were of good report, were of virtue, etc., etc. In other words, he says, look at your brothers and sisters in the Lord and think of those things in them that are of Christ. In other words, reducing it once more, Endeavor to see Jesus in the brethren, and you'll have no problems in your relationship with him. This is what John sets before us here. There is a new commandment, and yet it is not new, it is an old commandment. This is a commandment we have known since the day we were saved. For the day you were saved and the day I was saved, something happened in our hearts toward other Christians. Did it really happen in your heart? It's really funny how the people I used to look upon and criticize and despise and make fun of and say I didn't want to have anything to do with them. It's funny how precious they became to me suddenly, how different they looked to me, how there was something in my heart went out to those people even though I'd criticized them and mocked them and made fun of them. Now there was something that went out to them, something in my heart that reached out to them and wanted to embrace them. It was the love of God being worked in my heart by the Holy Spirit for those who had also known the love of God in Christ. I knew this commandment from the very beginning. You knew it from the very beginning. And we have known it right on down until now and the darkness in our hearts is passing like a parade and the light is coming clearer and clearer. And the commandment is made stronger and stronger in us and newer and newer so that we do know that we abide in the light and we do know that we are in him. What if a man hates his brother? What if, one, he has no natural affection for the saints? What if, two, he's not even enabled to feel anything for them based on a just estimate? He doesn't see anything special about believers. Oh, some of them are all right and some of them aren't. <laughs> he looks upon them in the flesh. He can't see any special estimate there in those believers that should make him feel anything more for them than for anybody else. John says this is hatred. And if his hatred is present, it is because that man walks in darkness even until now walks in darkness. Then in verse 11 he says, He that hateth his brother is in darkness, walketh not in darkness, knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. He starts out walking in darkness. He ends up with his eyes blinded. As a result, he doesn't know where he's going. If he can't see any cause in the saints of God for the affection of his heart, he really is in darkness, and he really is blind, and he really does not know where he's going. All right? Let's look at the positive side. He that loveth, verse 10 says, his brother, abideth in the light. There is none occasion of stumbling in him. Now, the word love, this verse has to be interpreted by the Bible, by the Holy Spirit, just as we did the word hate. We think when a man hates somebody that there is this terrible animosity and hostility in his heart towards that person that results in vengeance and working evil against him. This is not the Holy Spirit's idea of hatred. His idea of hatred is just an absence of love void of natural affection and void of any affection even based upon a just estimate of the man. What always 
is what is his interpretation of law? What does it mean then, he that loveth his brother? Well, first of all, love was demonstrated in the cross of Calvary. John 3.16, the golden verse of the Bible, says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 1 John 3.16 assures us that this is the place where we see love demonstrated. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. It takes 35 English words to translate the word love out of the Greek. It means a self-sacrificial heart that's called out of the heart, a self-sacrificial love called out of the heart due to the preciousness of the object loved. And to demonstrate it at the cross of Calvary, it goes like this. When God looked upon the world, when he looked upon mankind, there was a stirring in his heart. There was something from down deep inside of God, if you can understand that language, that was called out of the innermost parts of his being. This thing, this love that was called out of the heart of God resulted in self-sacrifice. It wasn't just a gooey, gummy, goody feeling that he had. He said, oh, I love the world, I love the world, I love the world. Love that's real demands sacrifice. Not something we can dispense with, self-sacrifice. This kind of love just can't be satisfied until it's given everything that it has and everything it is. So when God looked at mankind, this love down in his heart prompted him to give himself. He could have given all the angels. He could have given Moses. He could have given Elijah. He could have given David. He could have given the world. He could have given the universe and made himself another. I want to just kind of put in practical language this kind of love that makes you give the shirt off your back. This is the kind of love that will make you give everything you have and yourself too. And when God looked at mankind, he loved them so much that he said, well, I'd give even myself for them. And so he gave his son, which was the same as giving himself, for he and the son were one. And so he sent his son into the world to die for those he loved. This was a self-sacrificial love called out of his heart due to the preciousness of the object loved. These sinful, wicked, corrupt, vile, depraved human beings were so precious to God that his love demanded that he give himself for them. Now, do you think God would have ever given anything to us had he looked upon us as we were? He would say, well, what do they deserve besides hell? Well, that bunch of good-for-nothing people, I give them nothing. But this is not love. This is love. Love that pays no attention to what the beloved is. Love that covers and hides and takes away a multitude of sins that he might love freely. Love that loves in spite of of the fact that there is nothing there that demands love. God is love. He does not have the capacity to love. He is love. And when he looked upon us, his great heart was moved to give himself for us. We were just that precious in his sight. That's how precious we were. The love of God is further demonstrated in the cross and because of Jesus. The Lord Jesus was God's son. God was his father. He loved the Father, and the Father loved him. He dwelt in the love of God. He abode in the love of God from an eternity past. And when the Lord Jesus saw the preciousness of the human race to his Father, when he saw how much his Father loved them, the love of Jesus for his Father demanded that he give himself for that same human race that his father might enjoy the love of man for him. So it was God the Father who loved us 
and sent his son, and it was God the Son who loved the Father enough to be obedient unto him, even unto the death of the cross. So you see, this is no new commandment. This commandment was first demonstrated in the Savior when he went to the cross of Calvary to give himself in love to the brethren because he loved the Father. Is that too complicated? Okay. So that's where we perceive the love of God. And this is where we perceive or understand or comprehend what it is that works in us toward those who are saved. We look upon those who know and love our Lord Jesus. And they are precious to us because they are precious to him. And we cannot deny that he is precious to us. You know, I had a lot of problems with this, and maybe I'm not very articulate tonight, but I had a lot of problems with this when I was first saved. This is the problems I had. I kept trying to love people because of themselves, and I just couldn't get that done. <laughs> I haven't been able to get it done since. Have you? Can't do it. Oh, I could motor along for a day or two, and then those contrary people. There was never anything wrong with me. It was always them. <laughs> I'd get my heart all straightened out towards someone, and I'd say, you know, in the religious world, they just wear themselves out this. I tell you, most people in the religious world have to have their shoes half soled often because they run back and forth to each other, confessing their sins to one another, and say, my heart's not right towards you. Well, listen, all you need to do is get your heart right towards the Father. And get your heart right towards the Lord Jesus, your heart will be right towards all the brethren. No problem. Be nothing to straighten out. It'll be all right with them. I had a lot of problems because I used to try and love people for themselves, for their sakes, and I couldn't do it. And one day I got tired of trying, and I just started to be honest with the Lord and told him how I felt about it. It was a tremendous relief. Just to be honest with the Lord and say, Lord, I'm trying, but I can't muster up anything. I know that that man's my brother in the Lord, but I tell you, Lord, I just can't hardly go in, you know. And uh, the Lord sh began to show me that I was going at this thing all wrong. He was saying things to me like this. I never asked you to go out and love these people because of what they were. And he took me back there and showed me what he said to Peter. Peter, lovest thou me? Me? He didn't say, love. do you love the sheep, Peter? He said, do you love me? Well, if he just said, Peter, do you love the sheep? Peter had been <coughs> digging holes in the sand for the rest of his life trying to think of something to say. Because he, he, he knew that the Lord knew all things and he couldn't lie to him. <laughs> He'd say, well, like everybody but Bartholomew, and you know, we had a fight. <laughs> And then Nathaniel, he's smart, Alec, and I don't get along with him too well. But he said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? That's the only issue. Answer me. Look me in the eye. Look at the wounds in my hands and in my side and answer me one thing. Do you love me? Lord, thou knowest all things, and thou knowest that I love thee. Why, Peter couldn't have denied that. No Christian can deny that. No believer can deny that he loves Jesus. He may not know what he feels towards others, but he knows he loves Jesus. Jesus saying, all right, feed my sheep. These are my sheep. You can't love me, Peter, and ignore my sheep, because I love these sheep. I gave my life for these sheep. I shed my blood for these sheep. These wounds were made for these sheep. How can you stand there and tell me that you love me and say, I don't care what happens to your sheep? It's impossible. This is why we love the sheep. And I learned that if I didn't get this straight in my heart, the time would come that I'd just never be able to, to minister to God's people again. Because sooner or later, the sheep will wear you out if you keep your eyes on the sheep. And it's really a very simple proposition. I just have to keep being reminded of the love of Jesus. And then what I do for you or do to you, I do because I love him. This is what Paul was trying to say when he said, I am your servant for Jesus' sake. This is what he meant when he said, I am free of all men, yet I am servant to all. You can't tell me that you love me 
and hate and despise and ignore and neglect my wife and my children? That isn't real. That isn't consistent with what you say. If you love me, you will feel toward them what you feel for me. Regardless of the fact that if your relationship have to stand or fall to them individually, it might not stand. But you feel towards them what you feel for me. We feel towards the brethren what we feel for the Father. We have in our hearts for the saints what we have for Jesus. Because they're precious to him. And so this is what John is saying on the positive side. Love, he who loveth his brother. There ought to be something down inside of him that responds when he looks upon those who know Jesus. Something that responds would make him give himself if necessary. I know this to be true. I've seen this in the lives of God's people. They don't go around making speeches about it. They go around testifying about it. But it's there. That if a brother was in need, real need, and I'm going to say this because it's true, very few of us have ever known what need is. Do you agree to that? Very few of us have never known what need is. Oh, we didn't get all our wants, but very few times in your life did you ever go hungry, or were you ever cold, or were you ever without a place of shelter? And if a brother was in need, and another brother had this world's good, so John argues in 1 John 3, if the love of God dwelt in him, it would so move him to compassion that he would meet the needs of that brother. I believe that. Why? Simply because he cannot deny the love of God in each. He loves the brother because he loves the Father. He loves the brother because he loves Jesus. And because Jesus is in him, because the Holy Spirit dwells in him, he's only the instrument that reflects the love of God for that man. I'll give you another good example. The most hated man in the eyes of the world is the believer. The believer is despised by the world around him. Didn't Jesus say so? He said, marvel not if the world hate you. It hated me. We go out here in this society try to live for Jesus, try to manifest the love of God to those around us, and they hate us. They despise us. Yet the believer is the only man in the world who has any real love for that man. The believer is the only man in the world who has any compassion for that unsaved man. And the only man in the world who really cares what happens to that man. I remember an unsaved man that I had a lot of dealings with. And he used to keep asking me, are you my friend? He hated me, and he didn't want to hear what I had to say. He kept wanting me to do something else for him, but he didn't want me to talk about Jesus anymore. And when I kept assuring him that the only thing that I could really do for him that would be of lasting good was to tell him about Jesus. He said, I thought you were my friend. Are you really my friend? And I said, I'm probably the only friend you have. Because in spite of himself, I did love him. I couldn't help it. I loved him because Jesus loved him. I loved him because God loved him. I could never love him in a thousand years because of what he was or because of any capacity I had. But what I was feeling toward him was what the Lord himself felt toward him through me. How do you know that you abide in him? Well, you know it because you know he abides in you. <laughs> and you know he abides in you because you have a capacity to love your brethren. And unsaved people can't do that. Unsaved professing Christians have an absence of natural affection. Oh, they love everybody. Oh, I feel the same towards all mankind. We're all in the family of God. They have a lack of natural affection. Oh, they wouldn't say they cared any more for one person than they would for another. Well, I don't mind telling you I do. I think more of my wife and my children than anybody else's wife and their children. I can't help myself. It's just natural to me. Is that wrong to do that? I always thought it was the right good thing. 
I love my mother more than I love anybody else's mother. Because she's just a special mother to me. She brought me into this world. I love my father more than I love anybody else's father. That's natural affection. And I love the family of God better than anybody else's family. Because we have the same father. Because we share the same life. And because we have a relationship that nobody else can enjoy but those who are in that family. And it is because the Father is in the Son and because the Son is in us and because we are in Him. Now, let me close with this. This has worked in us, I've been saying throughout the message, by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us, Romans 5, 5 says so, that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who is given unto us. And the original brings out how the Holy Spirit fills the believer's heart up with love until it overflows and spills out on other people. It is not our love for God that he fills us up with. God's love for us. The more we think about how much God loved us, the more we are reminded of how much he loved others. And so we begin to feel towards others what he feels for us. This is performed by the Holy Spirit, and only the Holy Spirit can do this. It's listed in Galatians 5 as the fruit of the Spirit. So if you have anything in your heart for the brethren, it's the absolute evidence of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in you. Let me give you a good example. Remember when Paul went to Philippi and he got arrested? And he was turned over to the jailer, who was a very brutal man, and he was beaten. And he was put in chains and stocks and cast into the inner prison. But at midnight he began to sing. And uh, sing praises to God and to pray. And the other prisoners heard him and the jailer heard him too, he and Silas. And suddenly there was this great earthquake and the walls were shaken down and the prison was opened. And the jailer called for a light and he came running in and he fell down before Paul and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And he took him, and he taught him the word of the Lord. And the jailer believed with all of his heart in the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. And before morning, it's one of the most wonderful scenes in the book of Acts. Before morning, this brutal jailer, who had opened Paul's back with a lash, has a basin of water and a towel, and he's washing the back of Paul and Silas. A few hours before he was lashing him. A few hours before he hated him. A few hours before he didn't have any natural affection for him. A few hours before he couldn't even make a just estimate of him that would muster up some affection in his heart toward him. A few hours before he felt nothing for this man. Now he so loves this man that he would humble himself. <coughs> Most of us would have called a servant and said, Watch the man's back, not the jailer. He took the basin and the towel and he wiped those stripes himself. He wiped them because he loved that man. And I'll tell you why he loved that man. He loved that man because Jesus was in that man. He loved Jesus. He loved Jesus and Jesus was in that man and he couldn't help but love that man. And if he'd have said, Jesus, I love you and I believe in you, but I don't love that man, the Holy Spirit would have said to him, you are still in darkness, jailer. Your eyes are blinded. You don't know where you're going. You don't abide in him. You're an unsaved man. This is the demonstration of the reality of the love of Jesus in us. And John closes his positive thought with this. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. It has a twofold meaning. One is, he doesn't stumble himself. He has the light. He doesn't stumble over this loving others business. And others don't stumble over his lack of love. For well, there's no stumbling block in him. The love of Jesus is real in him, and others are not stumbled. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for thy word tonight, and we pray that the Holy Spirit would give it meaning in each of our hearts. We pray for all who are believers tonight that wherever they are, they will demonstrate and manifest 
this one badge of identification. In this shall all men know that you're my disciples and that you have love one to another. We pray that the Holy Spirit would work this love in us and for others by bringing us to a constant day-by-day confrontation with the love of Jesus for our own soul. We can only love others as we ought to, as we love Jesus as we should. Help us to remember that principle that when our love for him is right and our love for you is right, it will be right with all those who are in your family. Help us to keep our eyes on him. We thank you tonight for loving us. We thank you for the enablement to share that love. As the Holy Spirit works it in our hearts, spills it out of our hearts into the lives of others. In Jesus' precious name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Lord bless you.